Hi everyone, welcome to the first lecture in WebLab, Intro to Git and GitHub, two very important tools that we'll be using throughout your time in WebLab and most likely beyond as well. This will essentially be a slightly slower and more expanded version of the lecture that Kenneth gave in class today. And so let's dive in and talk about Git. So what is Git? Git is a version control system. And you might ask, what do you mean when you say that? Well, that basically means that we want to keep track of the changes that we're making to a set of code over time. And version control is the practice of doing that. Why is that important? Well, we might consider the following example. Let's say that we have a person called Ben, and Ben is writing some file of some sort. So he has a file, and he's working with a classmate called Alice. And Alice sees that file, and she, of course, thinks that it's a very nice file. And so she's like, Ben, why don't you send me that file? And so Ben sends that file over to her, probably over something like email, and now Alice has that file. She reads over it, and she decides that she can make it even better by making some changes to it. And so Alice modifies that file. And then, of course, Ben wants that improved file. And so Alice sends it back over email to Ben. So now Ben has this file that he created and that Alice improved upon. Now imagine that Ben were a programmer and not necessarily just the writer. So Ben has a programming file here. And is there anything different about this situation? Well, probably yes, actually. Because in programming, when you're making a website, you have all sorts of HTML files and CSS files. Let's say he has an HTML file for a home page. Maybe he has another for a profile page and another for a team page and about page. And so Ben has a whole host of files. And because he and Alice are working on the same project, Alice has a whole host of files as well. And what can go wrong with this? Well, there are three things I would like to talk about. And one of them is the synchronization of files. So let's go back to our example of Ben and Alice. And let's say that Ben finds a problem with one of the code files that he has. So he finds that there's a bug in line three and he goes ahead and corrects that. So that file has been modified now and edited. Now, Alice does not know about that. And so she's thinking, you know, the deadline for web Lab is coming up and I should just go ahead and submit my code. And so she does that. And it turns up that this team has submitted a buggy website. And so of course, they're both sad about this outcome. So that's what I call a synchronization issue where nobody knows which file is the best to use at any one time. There's a lot of communication that needs to go on, and it's not very automatic, which means that there can be some problems that arise. Another issue that I want to talk about is what I call the collaboration of files. So going back to our example of Alice and Ben, we have Ben who's looking through a code, Alice looking through a code too, and Ben finds some bugs again. And this time, Alice notices that there's some formatting that can be improved. And so they both go ahead and Ben modifies two files, Alice modifies one file. And then they need to match up the set of code, right? Because they need to have one set of code that they can submit. And so Ben notices, our code is different. And what does he do? Well, he tells Alice to go through line by line. I know you make changes in 50 different places, but can you copy the changes over one by one? And of course, that's maybe just some unnecessarily tedious work that Alice now has to do. And so she's sad, right? So that's another problem that we have to deal with. And this problem arises because if people make changes to this file and they don't make those changes in real time, then we are going to have two different versions of the same file. And how are we going to know how to join them the best way? And so that's another problem. And the third problem that I'm going to talk about is version history. So let's go back to Ben. And Ben realizes, oh, you know, I might be able to make my code better if I delete, let's say, 31 lines of code and add some 24 new lines of code. And so Ben goes ahead and does that, and he modified his file, and he's happy right now. And then an hour later, Ben revisits his code and realizes, oh no, my code worked better with those lines I deleted. You want them back. And how do I get them back? Well, I can't easily do that right now. And so Ben is sad again. And so if we break something because we're making a lot of changes and we don't save our file Oftentimes, along the way, we can't easily go back to a working copy of the code. And so these are three problems that we want to fix that would make collaboration a lot easier. And so you might be thinking, how do we solve these problems? Isn't there something that already exists called Google Docs? And Google Docs sort of works, 
it solves these synchronization and merging issues. You can have two people work on the same document in real time. And as one person makes changes, the other person sees those changes immediately. Google Docs also solves the third problem that we have, version history, because it tracks version history automatically. But is Google Docs fully a good thing? And I would say not really, because real-time collaboration is usually not what you want. So let's say that Ben and Alice are working on two different features on the same page, the home page, let's say. Ben wants to add in this nav bar, and Alice wants to add in this grid format of pictures, let's say, the slideshow, this picture slideshow. So when Alice is adding in the slideshow, she wants to load it up on the home page and see whether it looks good or not. But Ben is making changes to the nav bar, and he breaks the home page. And so Alice cannot easily see whether her change is good or not. And so sometimes when we're developing features, we accidentally introduce bugs. And we want to only make these changes propagate to other people's files when we know for sure we're ready with them. And so that's why Google Docs is not an ideal option. We want to be able to work on changes locally and then sync up and merge these changes when we know that they're ready to be merged with other people's code. And so how do we solve these issues? Well, we will use something called Git. And to introduce Git a little bit more thoroughly, we're going to talk about Git in terms of what it does. So what does Git do? It basically tracks changes that are being made to a set of files through something that we'll call math. And then as an example of this, let's say that we have a file called mydoc.txt. And in this file, I'm writing a story. So I'm literally writing, I'm writing a story. It's really good. And about cats. And that's the first version of the story that I have. I, of course, then go back and maybe make some changes. So I add another line and I say, like Corgis. And that's version two that I have right here. And maybe I go in and I delete a line. I delete and about cats. And that's version three. And so I have three versions of this file that I've been working on, my doc.txt. So what essentially goes on behind the scenes? What has changed? Well, between version one and version two, I've added the line like Corgis at line four. Between version two and version three, I've deleted the line and about cats at line three. And so we have three different versions and we have the changes that have been going on between these versions. So this is what we have. We have version one of the story and we know what changes we made between version one and version two and version two and version three. So knowing those changes, we can reconstruct version two and version three. So if I know that I added the line like Corgis at line four, and I take that and add that to version one, I can recreate version two. If I know that I deleted the line and about cats at line three, and I know what version two looks like, I can recreate version three. That's sort of how Git, that's sort of how Git works. And there are some important terminology that we're going to introduce now. So in Git terminology, a repository is a set of files that you want to track changes on. It's a set of files that you're working on. And in WebLab, it's likely to be your website. There's also something called a commit, which is the set of changes that you're making from one version to another. So for example, like Corgis, adding like Corgis would be one set of commit. Deleting it about cats would be another commit. And of course, you could only go from version one to version two immediately by packaging these two sets of changes into a single commit. And so that's the math that we've been talking about. And then the third term is the log, the set of commits for each version of the repository. And we can also call that the commit history. They mean the same thing. So let's revisit those problems that we talked about and think about whether or not Git solves those problems or not. We can immediately see that version history is solved because Git keeps a log of the changes that we make to a file. We can easily revert to any previous version of the file that we want. Now let's think about some of the other problems. Has synchronization and collaboration been fixed? And the answer is sort of. We use something called Git servers. Git servers are basically a remote version of a code repository, and they can be a central ground truth that are used by multiple people. So in this example, we have six people, and they're all talking to the central Git server here. And how does that help? Let's say that we have Ben, who has three files this time. And Ben makes changes to one of those files. He sends those changes 
to the central Git server, and we call those changes a commit, as we talked about earlier. And so those changes go to the central Git server. When they get there, that's what the action of sending a commit to a Git server is called a push. When the file gets there, the server can now give this file to other people. So for example, we have Alice here. There's the modified file in the Git server. Alice can do something called a pool, which is an action of getting a file from a remote Git server and take that modified file and put it in her local computer. And so now the change that Ben has been making has been propagated over to Alice's files. So now Ben and Alice both have the same set of updated files. Now let's say, oh, and let's talk about some more terms. So some more terms I've been using so far are a commit, which is a noun for a package set of changes. A push to push is the action of sending commits to the Git server. And to pull is the action of getting updated files from the Git server. But what about merges? So let's say that we have Ben and Alice. Uh, Alice makes a change to a file. She sends the Git server. So that's called a push again. And simultaneously, Ben also makes a change to a file. And he tries to push it to the remote Git server. But the Git server says, no, your file and my file don't have a common ancestor. You need to first do something called a pool and try to merge your files on your computer. And so Ben pulls the file and he takes the changes that Alice has made and he combines them with the changes that he has made to create a common merged file. And then he sends that over to the Git server. And so that way, the remote Git server has an updated file with challenges, with the changes that both Alice and Bill have, and Ben have made. And so this solves the issue with synchronization because we can push changes to a central unified source of truth, the remote Git server, and then pull the changes before modifying code further on our computer. Now let's think about collaboration. Or actually, let's first talk about what happens during a merge. So let's say that I have this document again, my doc.txt, and there's local words on my computer where it says I'm writing a story, it's really good, and about cats. And then there's the version on the remote Git server that includes the line like 4Gs. So if I want to pull this immediately, I can very easily do that. There are no conflicts. It's a very easy merge. Now let's say that my local version includes an additional line that says, I love cats. Now, what can I do? I can pull and there's a merge conflict. So the remote Git server would tell me to merge manually. And I can choose to do that by changing my sentence to reflect that I love cats and Corgis, and then push that over to the Git server. And now the remote Git version has been updated. So when I want to collaborate, I can merge the files based on the commits. And there's an algorithm that will try to do that automatically. But if, for example, two people are editing the same line of code, then that algorithm might fail, and we'll have a human manually merge two different commits. Woohoo! We've solved all three problems that we have. So how do we actually use Git? And we'll be using something called the command line. And this is a common symbol that you're going to see for the command line. Sometimes it's also called the terminal window. And of course, these are some other tools that we might be using, Fog Explorer, VS Code, and Git. And I happen to be from California. And something that you might hear from just previous web lab instructors is that in and out has sort of a secret menu. If you know to ask for it, you can order animal style fries or animal burgers, but those things are not explicitly listed on the menu. And similar to in and out they might say, a computer has a secret menu too. There are certain things that you can do with a computer. You only need to know how to tell the computer to do it. And that computer secret menu is what we call a terminal interface. In order to use the terminal, there is some helpful terminology. So we also refer to files in terminal. We refer to directories, which are essentially folders. The terminal is also known as a command line window. And there's some helpful abbreviations in the command line. We can use a period as shorthand for our current directory, the directory that we're working in right now. We can use two periods as shorthand for the parent directory, which is the directory that is above the directory that we're working right now. And we can use a tilde symbol 
for the home directory, which is most likely the default directory that you're going to start in as you open terminal. And let's have a short demo to show what the terminal is like. So you can open up the terminal on a Mac and you can immediately see some piece of information. So you have this thing at the front here that tells you basically who you are. It's showing your username and your workstation. And you can type the command pwd, which stands for pass print working directory, to see where you are in your computer's file system. And so it tells you that I'm in this folder called users, and then this subfolder called Edward. And most terminals will also show your current directory here. And this is the tilde because this is the default directory. Another command that's helpful is mkdir, which stands for make directory. So I can make a directory called weblab. And remember, a directory is the same as a folder. So I'm making a folder called weblab. And how do I see that? I can type, well, first off, I can type cd or change directory to move into the weblab folder. And you can notice that this tilde has been replaced by weblab because I've changed the folder that I'm in. I can print my working directory again to see that I've indeed moved to a subfolder of the Edward folder called weblab. And so we're now in the newly created weblab directory. We can type the clear command to basically just reset and delete everything on this window right now. So let's reduce some clutter. And then we can use the touch command to create a new file. And I've heard this referred to as sort of the magic touch. So whenever you want to create a file, you can just type touch and then name of your file with the extension. How do we see what files we have? You can type the ls command, which is short for list, to see the files that you have in the, for, in the folder that you're working in currently. And right now we have this one file that we just created, file.js. You can create another file, type in list again to see that we now have two files show up as we're expecting. And we can also create a new directory, let's call it new dir, and see it show up in our files as well. We can also move files. So we can move file.js over into new dir. And if we type list again, we won't see file.js being listed here because it's in a subfolder. If we peek inside of new dir by typing list new dir, we can see file.js being moved there. What happens if we want to move a file to a directory that doesn't exist? So here I'm typing move file2.js to this folder called file2belongs here. We can see that there is no folder called file2belongs here. What do you think happens? You can pause this video and just think about it. What ends up happening is that you move the file from the current directory to the new directory, but with this new name that you specified here. So this is basically just renaming your file. Instead of having a file called file2.js, you now have a file called file2belongs here. Pretty interesting, right? You can also copy files. So here I'm copying file2belongs here and creating a duplicate file called file2double. And you can type list, you can see both files right there. Let's do some cleanup now and delete some of these files that we've been creating. So we can remove file2belongs here and remove file2double. And we type in list and we see new dir. Now, what can we do to remove new dir? So to remove a directory, we use the rndir command for remove directory. And we try to run this on new dir. We say we have an error message. It says directory not empty. So what can we do? You can pause the video and think about how we might want to delete the new dir file. Folder, I mean. So if you thought that you could go ahead and delete the file with new dir and make it empty and then delete the new dir folder, you thought correctly. So let's change directory and go into new dir. Let's see the files that we have in there. It's file.js. And let's remove file.js. Let's then move back to the parent directory. So remember that two dots is an abbreviation for the parent directory. We're going to change, we're going to cd into the parent directory and then see what we have in that folder. So we only have new there now. It's empty. We can go ahead and remove it. We type in list again and we see nothing because we've successfully deleted everything in this web lab folder. So for a quick recap, these are the functions that I've been demonstrating. There's the pwd command for print working directory, which tells you basically where you are. There's a ls command to tell you the files and the directories that you have. It's very useful. 
there's the CD directory, there's a CD command to help you change your directory. There's the mkdir command to create a new directory. There's the mv command to move a file. There's the cb command to copy a file. There's the arm command to delete a file. And there's the arm there command to delete a directory. So now, with that knowledge of terminal, we can now go ahead and use git. This is on a Mac, and on a PC, there's an equivalent called git bash. You can open up your terminal and follow along. <clears throat> So first off, I go ahead and I create a new directory called weblab-test. And I change into that directory. So now when I create a new file, like index.html, that file is created within the weblab-test directory. I type the command git init, which starts an empty git repository. And you can see your terminal telling you that right here. I then go ahead and check the status of my repository by typing git status. And it says that we're on the main branch, there are no commits yet, and there's one untracked file. And the reason that the file is untracked is because I created the file, I created my new Git repository, and I didn't do anything to add that file to the changes I'm tracking in this Git repository. And so it says that there's nothing to commit right now, but that there are untracked files. And we can use the git add command, as they say, to add in a file to be tracked by git. And so we add index.html, our new file. We type in git status again. And we can see that indeed there's a new file that's being tracked right now called index.html. We can then push this change. Remember, that's called a git commit using the git commit dash m command. After the dash m, you type in your message, which would go alongside that commit. And it could be very useful for you as you're figuring out, or as you collaborate with someone else, why you made a particular commit. Basically, just a short abbreviation to help yourself. So you can see that I made a commit with the message. I made my very first git commit. There's one file that's changed. There are zero lines of insertions and zero lines of deletions within that file. And you can check with git status that now I have nothing to commit. The working tree is clean. We can also type git log to see a history of our past commits. So there's that very first commit that we made. Now, we want, to, we want to think about how we can store this information on a remote Git server. So we go ahead to GitHub, and this is what the homepage for GitHub looks like. It's just github.com. And we can sign in to our existing account or sign up to create a new account and see what we've been working on. And let's go ahead and create a new repository. So that's this helpful green button right here. And let's just call it something. You could call it weblab-test. Let's scroll down along the page. And let's create a repository. So this is what you're going to see. This is a brand new repository. has nothing in it. And we're going to follow instructions here to push an existing repository from the command line to this remote Git repository. And something I should add is that Git and GitHub are completely unrelated. GitHub uses Git, but they're not, but they don't, but they're not owned by the same parent organization, basically. I sort of think about it as RStudio and R, where a lot of our programmers use RStudio, or some of our programmers use RStudio. They're developed by different entities. And so anyways, we're going to go back to our command line. And we're going to follow those instructions and type in git remote at origin with the link to the git hub repository. And what this does is it links this remote Git server with our local with our local device. And so we know that whenever we want to check with the remote server, we're going to check this remote server. And then I'm going to go in and push this to the remote Git server. And that's done. So we refresh our github.com page, and we can see that our very first commit is living right here on this server. Now let's say that we take a break and we go to sleep. And then after some time, we wake up and we open that index.html file. And if you remember, we created it, but we did not add any lines of code or delete any lines of code within it. So this is just an empty file. And let's say that we add something. We have two lines of code. How do I write a website? Let's add more div containers. 
and we can check with git status that it says that one file has been modified, index.html. No surprises there. Let's add index.html, and then let's write another commit. And I'm just going to call this one another day, another commit, my second one. So that there are two insertions. Remember the two lines of code that I added, and that's to be expected. And I try to push this, but I get an error. It says error, failed to push some refs to this remote Git server. Updates were rejected because the remote contains work that you don't have locally. This is usually caused by another repository pushing to the same ref. You may want to first integrate the remote changes, e.g. git pull, before pushing again. See the note about fast forwards in git push dash dash help for details. And if we go check that git server, we can realize, oh, there's a different person, let's say other Edward, who made some sort of a commit five minutes ago. And so that has led to a merge conflict. So how do we resolve merge conflicts? Well, what we do, if you remember, is we pull from the remote Git server, and then we try to merge these two different versions of the code locally on our device, and then push that to the remote Git server. So I pull this, and I get this message that I have divergent branches, and I need to specify how to reconcile them. And I'm opening this up in VS code, by the way, and we can see it's been it's been it's been labeled here that this is the code that I had locally. How to write a website? Let's add more div containers, and then this is the new code that was committed to the remote Git server when I was sleeping. So it says just what kind of cast? Too many things open a Chrome, a tabby, uh -huh. and I can choose what I want to do to resolve this conflict. VS Code gives you some helpful options. You can accept current change accept incoming change, accept both changes, or compare the changes. And so I go ahead and, oh, this is showing that we have these section dividers that separate the code that we have locally on our device and the code that we pulled from the remote Git server. And anyways, I go in, I go in and I decide to combine both of these because they're both useful. They're both different too. And so here you can see, this is what I have locally on my computer originally. And then the other stuff is the stuff that I pulled from that remote Git server. And so now that I've made this change, I can go to my terminal and, oh yeah, I can type in Git status to see that I've made changes to my index.html file. It says both modified because this index.html file has been modified from the common parent that the my local version has and that is on the remote Git server. And I can use git add index.html to add this to my commit. And actually, you can also just use a dot to automatically add all the files that have had changes made to them. Git status, check that I've modified index.html, and then push this. Oh, and then, of course, package this up as a commit. My comment is just like, fixing merge conflict, and then push this to the remote Git server. And that's done. And you can also use type git log to see the changes that you made. So these are the changes that have been made to this particular remote Git server. And my, my, new, my new commit is now up there on GitHub. And you can also click here to see just your commit history, of course. And phew, we've now dealt with a merge conflict. So just one last thing is to remember to download this Catbook workshop that we're going to be using across multiple different classes. And you can do that by going to weblab.is slash catbook, clicking on the green code button, and then copying the CRL. Then in your terminal window, first do a CD to go to whatever directory you want to be working with, either CD documents or CD desktop, for example, and then type in git space clone space this website link. And if you have any problems, reach out to us or go to office hours we're always going to be happy to help and hear from you. And so as a recap, today we talked about the command line or the terminal, and we also talked about using Git. And both of these are very essential. If you have any questions, reach out. Just to give a brief recap, these are the commands that we talked about. Git init to start a new Git repository. Git add at a certain file name to start tracking that file. Git commit dash M and your message to create a commit. And then, of course, we want to make sure that we push those changes to the remote Git server. 
We also need to pool sometimes in order to resolve merge conflicts. And git status and git log are two helpful info commands that give us the current status and the log of the past commits in a git server. This is a slide that I pulled from Kenneth. We often want to pull, pull, pull from the git server, resolve the merge conflicts, add our changes, commit, push, pull again. And we also have some helpful cheat sheets at weblab.mit.edu slash resources. You can read over on your own time. So thank you for watching. And actually, that's sort of a mistake there. Our next lecture is HTML CSS with Nick, Quan, and Felina. Thanks, and reach out if you have any questions.